So um, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, all you that are reaching us today to see this very interesting talk by Professor Michel Stan from uh, Virginia, University of Virginia. So um, Mr. Stan is teaching and doing research in the areas of high performance, low power VLSI, processing in memory, temperature aware secrets and architecture, cyber physical systems, spintronics and non-electronics. He leads the high performance, low power lab and is associate director of the Center for Automata Processing. Uh, Professor Stum received the PhD in 96 and the master in 94 degrees from uh, University of Massachusetts in Amherst and the diploma in 84 from the Polytechnica University of Bucharest in Romania. Since uh, 96, he has been with uh, the uh, electric computing engineering department at the University of Virginia, where he is now the Virginia Microelectronics Consortium professor. He was a co-author of Best Paper Awards at Azilomar 19, Laskas 19, uh, Celsius 17, uh, ESQED 08, uh, GLS VLSI 06, uh, ISCA 03, and Shaman 02, and uh, IEEE Micro Top Picks in 2008 and 2003. He gave keynotes at uh, DCAS 18, SOC 16, GOG ARCH 16, uh, WO NDP 15, uh, INIS 15, and CNNA 14. Professor Stan is a fellow of IEEE, a member of ICM, and of uh, ETA Kappa Nu, Phi Kappa Phi, and Sigma Xi, his uh, age index is 55 and his I-10 index is 150. So thank you very much, Professor Michia, to attend, uh, to, to accept our invitation. And now the floor is with you to start uh, your talk. Uh. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Ricardo. And thank you, everyone, for attending this talk. And for those of you that are going to see on, on YouTube in the future, thank you for uh, spending the time. Um, uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, um, an, an interesting um, uh, subject. And it's something that um, you know many researchers are looking at. But I hope I'm going to show you uh, a different perspective. And talking about perspective, uh, I, I thought to try to start with a nice uh, picture of our uh, UVA uh, campus. We actually call it grounds. In the foreground, you have uh, the rotunda uh, designed by Thomas Jefferson. And in the back, uh, you can see the Blue Ridge Mountains, uh, which you can get some nice hiking. Um, so uh, here is a, a very high level outline uh, of my talk. and. Um, the, the emphasis is really on things that can uh, go wrong uh, with the, an integrated circuit. Uh, an integrated circuit is continuously, in many ways, under attack uh, and under stress, I should say. That's the real uh, technical word that's being used. So there are stresses because of uh, voltages, because of currents. Uh, and these um, uh, stresses, actually lead to what's called wear out. So in many ways, uh, although you know it's an electronic circuit, in many ways these processes are close to what happens in a mechanical system that gets uh, worn out. Uh, and there are many, many mechanisms actually. Um, and um, um, uh, some of them are listed here, and I'm going to only focus on a few of them. I'm going to focus on uh, bias temperature instability. I'm going to do focus a little bit on electromigration. I'm also uh, going to focus a little bit on non-volatile memory. Um, but there are two, two things, I think, that are uh, going to be uh, uh, quite different from most of the research that's going uh, on in all of these uh, uh, topics. So one is that I'm going to try to present a unified view of these uh, many, many different uh, uh, 
phenomena and uh, try to think about it a little bit more, uh, I would say, philosophically. Uh, and the other very important uh, difference, or um, uh, maybe, um, you know, it's the focus on the recovery part, because it turns out that, uh, uh, you know, these circuits uh, under stress, they wear out, but then when they are let without stress, uh, they do recover. So um, without further ado, again, um, just um, based on kind of how an integrated circuit looks like. So there is the front end of line, the devices, and there there are many uh, phenomena that uh, lead to wear out, uh, BTI, HCI, and a few others. Uh, the back end of line, which is the interconnect, the wires, you have electromigration, the vias, uh, and for non-volatile memories, and again, there are a bunch of them. Some of the more uh, common ones are flash and uh, RAM, or sometimes known as memristors. Uh, there you talk about uh, endurance. And uh, something that's kind of common, and you know, this is going to, to come a little bit more, is that uh, this wear out, and, and again, that's where the similarities with mechanical systems are also still quite valid. Uh, initially, there is a graceful degradation. So maybe the circuit becomes a little bit slower. Maybe the wire becomes a little bit more resistive. Uh, but then, you know, in time, eventually leads to, to an actual uh, catastrophic event, uh, basically uh, what we call a heart failure. Uh, so now just... Uh, to introduce these and I'm not again I'm not going to spend uh, a lot of time on any of them specifically because you know I could spend hours just on each of these phenomena and so I again it's more uh, a high level view of um, all of them uh, so first this um, uh, bias temperature instability and it has kind of two versions uh, for PMOS and NMOS, it's called NBTI for PMOS, PBTI for NMOS. Um, and uh, something that you typically see uh, by applying a voltage on the gate of a transistor, uh, you see a delta uh, VTH uh, shift that happens. And, you know, a typical um, um, plot is on the left where you see that in time, uh, there is a relatively fast uh, delta VTH degradation uh, that then kind of slows down. But as you keep a static DC voltage, uh, that keeps on going. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you apply a dynamic, uh, you know, an AC stress, um, you see that there is a, a quite uh, obvious uh, element of recovery. So the recovery is basically on the red uh, curve, uh, the fact that, you know, once you stop the stress, the delta VTH uh, immediately, uh, uh, you know, goes uh, uh, lower uh, and again, uh, faster at the beginning and then it slows down. And uh, so that's if you look at the actual VTH values. Uh, on the right, you see the effect of that at the circuit level. So at the circuit level, if you just look at the delay uh, of, uh, you know, of a gate, uh, basically the delay degrades uh, because of this, uh, basically the VTH increases in absolute value, uh, which means, uh, means that the device slows down. So that's just a very high level introduction. Now, if we look at electromigration, so electromigration is a wire. Um, and here I actually have, let's see if I can get the video to work. So here is an actual wire under a microscope uh, and the current is being passed. And you see initially there is this slow kind of degradation. And then, you know, eventually the, the wire actually breaks and that would be the heart failure. And and again, it, it is, um, um, you know, a, a very important uh, uh, element of um, uh, wear out for integrated circuits. And again, you can think about it in electronic terms, but it's 
pretty clear that it's almost like a mechanical uh, degradation. Uh, and then if you look at uh, uh, non-volatile memory, I'm sorry, uh, at non-volatile memory um, uh, endurance, uh, what you can see here is that um, um, there is, uh, you know, uh, quite uh, similar in some sense um, 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 uh, aspect. So the, when you um, um, uh, program and erase uh, a floating uh, gate um, uh, device for a flash, uh, it will lead to some form of um, uh, a degradation that, uh, and, and the, you know, one difference uh, from the previous two cases is that for a non-volatile memory of flash device, uh, the degradation has several uh, aspects. So it can lead to different kinds of errors. You can have errors in terms of uh, retention. So in other words, the, the charge on the, uh, on the device, um, um, and, you know, the state, uh, the bit that's being stored there get lost. And that's what's shown on this figure, this uh, silk uh, phenomenon. Uh, but there are other uh, uh, types of uh, errors that can happen. For example, the device may become uh, non-erasable, so it, it could become uh, stuck in one of the states. But fundamentally, you still have this kind of um, a graceful degradation at the beginning, uh, and eventually you end up with a heart failure. So... Uh, if we look, so again, I, I kind of promised you that uh, I'm going to have this uh, general view. So let's let's get to that. So the general view is that in all of these cases, I'm going to, and again, you know, these um, uh, statements are going to be true maybe 90% of the in the 90% of the cases and cover 90% of the issues. Uh, that in all these cases, you have some form of stress. So you can have a voltage or a current uh, that, uh, that is a stress. And I, I haven't talked about this, but this is an important uh, aspect. Temperature is an accelerating process. Uh, in other words, if uh, there is some form of degradation, and that's true for all of them, for BTI, for electromigration, if there is some form of degradation because of a you know, voltage or current stress, if the temperature increases, then the effect of that stress, in other words, the degradation is going to be higher uh, at high temperature. And now I'm going to make the case that this degradation, the wear out, is a physical change away from a low energy equilibrium. And I'll, I'll give a very intuitive example in the next slide. Uh, but, you know, one example is, uh, is this one that I just showed about the um, uh, non-volatile memory about flash, where um, when the, when the uh, transistor is, um, you know, new, <laughs> unused, uh, you know, there are um, these, you know, that uh, there are no traps that are being filled and, uh, you know, so it, it's, a, it's a low energy in some sense um, uh, state. But then if, when you apply the stress, when you program and erase this device, then those traps get filled. Uh, you have charges that are out of equilibrium and that leads to uh, all kinds of... Um, you know, degradation like this uh, uh, silk that's specific for the... Um, so uh, here is um, kind of, you know, a more detailed um, um, list, and I'm not going to go over, um, you know, all of these, um, you know, methods of dealing with this, uh, with these phenomena, but basically, um, the, uh, the type of techniques that people have been using until now are trying to adapt 
uh, or to somehow um, deal with the symptoms. So in other words, for example, I'll give you an example. If a, uh, if a circuit gets slower because of a VTI, then you know one thing that you can do is to adapt uh, your clock rate or to, uh, to make it a little bit slower, or you can increase the voltage to make it a little bit higher. Uh, using a margin basically achieves the same thing, but you are not really trying to uh, deal with the actual cause of that problem. You are really uh, dealing with the symptom. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about in the rest of this talk is on techniques to uh, attack the cause. Uh, and we are going to do that by um, trying to recover from wear out. So if wear out leads to a degradation in speed, we are going to try to be very proactive about uh, doing recovery. And we have these two keywords, uh, accelerated and active uh, recovery. Uh, and um, try to really erase in, in many ways the effect of the wear out. So um, again, the, the bold claim here is that many of these aging mechanisms have similar physics and um, um, you know, again, to, to just um, um, show this example of DTI, um, the physics of uh, BTI suggests that indeed the uh, uh, wear out mechanism is the result of taking the device out of equilibrium. So um, uh, again, I kind of uh, made already these, um, uh, these claims, uh, the uh, uh, wear out is a change from equilibrium qualitatively uh, all these um, phenomena will have some similarities quantitatively they are going to be quite different and let's go to an analogy to kind of uh, show you what i'm talking about with this equilibrium so let's think about a pile of rocks okay and the pile of rocks that's uh, in a low energy uh, state is really, uh, you know, everything is uh, kind of spread out. Uh, and, you know, that's kind of the lowest energy, uh, potential energy for all of those, um, uh, you know, uh, pieces of rock. Now, uh, you can, uh, what, what does it mean to take it out of equilibrium? So you can basically make a pile of rocks. So Again, that's out of equilibrium because now some of these um, rocks are going to have a higher uh, energy. Uh, and you can take them, you know, a lot out of equilibrium by making a really tall pile. Okay. And I would, again, in terms of analogy, the initial case is no stress. The, the one in the middle is low stress and the one uh, on the bottom is uh, kind of high stress. So now what does recovery mean? Uh, so for, uh, again, for a device, it would mean to bring back the threshold voltage, for example, that was worn out uh, because of stress uh, with BTI. But in this case of the, of the pile of rocks, you basically need to go back from this, you know, uh, uh, high pile of rocks to one that where all the rocks are spread out. And then you immediately think about possible strategies, right? So the, the first strategy is kind of the passive strategy. And actually this is what it is called uh, in the, you know, in the circuits community, it's called passive recovery. So basically passive recovery means you just remove the stress and you don't do anything. So how does, how do the rocks spread out? Well, if you wait long enough, geological times, you have, you know, winds, tornadoes, uh, you know, all kinds of phenomena that eventually will lead to, you know, that's why mountains eventually become all the, the bottom of a sea. 
that's a very slow process. So we don't want to do that or we don't want to do just that. Uh, the other thing that you can do is to add energy to the pile. Uh, and in this case, adding energy to the pile would be to shake the pile, right? And then intuitively the rocks would go, uh, you know, to the bottom. The, um, the equivalent of that for circuits is temperature, right? Temperature really shakes the, the charges around, shakes everything. Uh, and, you know, that's why that, like I said, uh, temperature accelerates stress, but it also accelerates recovering. The, the other thing, obviously, that you can do in this case uh, is to push down on the top of the, uh, you know, of the pile. Uh, and this is something where I think we are quite unique with our research uh, and, you know, thinking about the problem this way, in this more general way, uh, in many ways brought us to this, uh, you know, to this idea to activate the recovery. So not only do you accelerate it, but you activate it. So how do you activate it? Well, um, you'll see it. So in the case, for example, of electromigration, you uh, basically have a current that goes in the opposite. So if the stress current goes from left to right, then the active recovery current would go from right to left. Um, same with voltage. If a positive voltage is a positive, you know, it's a stress, then a, a small negative voltage is going to be an active uh, recovery. And of course, the most efficient one is when you do both active and accelerated recovery. So you push on the pile and you shake the pile at the same time. And uh, again, that's the title of this talk. So talking about these things. So... Um, Again, how does that apply now that, you know, we kind of have this concept, how does it apply to the different uh, phenomena that I already mentioned? And here you uh, can start to see some of the papers that uh, we wrote on this uh, topic. So, um, so this is about NBTI. Um, so again, um, uh, passive recovery, if you just re remove the stress, and that's the leftmost uh, case, um, it will, uh, you know, you will get some recovery. Um, then you can uh, accelerate the recovery by increasing the temperature uh, with no stress. Uh, you can activate the recovery uh, by um, applying a slightly, uh, you know, negative voltage. Um, and then you can accelerate and activate the recovery by applying a, a, a negative voltage at a high temperature. So uh, that's um, uh, kind of the intuition. So let's see how it works in practice. So uh, here are some actual experiments on chips. Um, so uh, we created um, basically a ring oscillator. That's kind of the standard way of uh, measuring uh, delay. Uh, and this is on a commercial uh, FPGA. Um, uh, so 75 uh, stages of a ring oscillator. And uh, on the left, you can kind of see the physical uh, layout uh, and the circuit uh, schematic. On the right, uh, you can see the results. So, um, and, and again, in the um, uh, kind of reliability community, people are talking about DC stress versus AC stress. Uh, the idea is with the DC stress, you just apply a DC voltage. With AC stress, you apply a, a kind of a pulsed uh, type of stress. Uh, and again, these results are just um, to confirm kind of what's already known from the, you know, from the uh, field. Uh, you can see that but with both uh, AC stress and DC stress, you have, um, um, you know, a degradation in, uh, in frequency. So the delay goes uh, uh, higher uh, and it, you know, the... The degradation uh, keeps getting uh, higher 
with the amount of stress uh, and it is higher for DC than AC. Uh, and on the bottom, you kind of see the more detailed uh, view of how uh, you know this degradation happens and then how the uh, recovery happens uh, as well. So again, nothing really spectacular yet. Uh, this is just um, a little bit of the physics explanation for the purpose of this talk. I'm not going to get into that. It has to do with uh, traps in the oxide and the interface. Um, and you know, on the on the bottom, you kind of see the um, the typical sawtooth kind of uh, result with stress and recovery. Um, but uh, I, I am going to to kind of um, uh, talk a little bit about uh, this aspect that I already mentioned that when you apply a stress, uh, there is a fast degradation uh initially and then the degradation uh, slows down uh and you know we try to kind of come up with an explanation for that and i think other people in the community have done that too but uh, one simple explanation is to look at the energy of different traps and if you just take into account kind of two categories of traps the low energy and the high energy traps um, and that's on the on the left of the slide. Uh, basically, what's going to happen is that the uh, uh, fast traps or the low energy traps are going to become fast traps, and they are going to trap and detrap, uh, you know, initially. And once those are filled, uh, then the high energy traps uh, also start to get filled, but you know, at a much slower rate. So that's what slows down the degradation. Um, what is interesting, though, when you know when you start to look at it, uh, at, in, you know, in this more physics uh, based, you start to uh, understand that um, some of those traps are going to stay filled even after you remove the stress, uh, and uh, in particular the the high energy traps, the slow traps. Um, you know, once they get filled, they will tend to stay filled for a long time uh, because the probability of detrapping uh, is really low. So uh, that explains uh, some of the uh, things that people have reported in, uh, in the literature. And uh, you can see that on the right. Uh, you, you can start to identify uh, two um two types of wear out uh there is the fast kind of wear out which is reversible so in other words uh you you know you get the degradation uh, quite fast but when you remove the stress also the degradation goes away quite fast so that's reversible but then there's going to be some part of the degradation that's going to um remain there uh, and you know that's called irreversible uh, wear out um, and again on the right you can see um, uh, you know two kind of scenarios with um, um, uh, you know with uh, stress and recovery and the brown one the one on the bottom uh, is basically uh, a low temperature uh, stress uh, and and uh, you know uh, uh, recovery um, and then in the um, uh, the one on the you know, the blue one is uh, an activated recovery. Um, um, case where uh, the recovery is both at a high temperature and with a slight uh, negative voltage. So two things. One is that the um, uh, you get more recovery as is expected uh, with active recovery at high temperature. 
Uh, but in both of these cases, you see that there is still, so the, the line on the top is really the, the reference um, uh, frequency with no stress. You see that you still have an, um, uh, an amount of irreversible wear out in both cases. And uh, basically on the, uh, on the bottom, uh, you see, um, uh, you know, the um, a, a pulsed, uh, kind of a version of the same thing, uh, basically an AC uh, stress. But something that that's kind of interesting on the bottom is that if you look at the amount of irreversible wear out, that kind of plateaus after uh, a few of those cycles. So initially you have a fast recovery and some irreversible, you know, some more fast recovery and some irreversible, but eventually it kind of gets into a periodic situation where um, you don't have an increase in the amount of irreversible wear out. So this kind of experiment immediately kind uh, you know made us think: Can we play with the um, 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 trade-off between how much stress, how much recovery, in order to optimize uh, the result? And what we found is really, really interesting. And, you know, this, um, um, you know, initially when we, we got this result, I was uh, a little bit skeptical, but now I'm, uh, you know, I'm very confident. And uh, I, you know, one of the uh, main things that I hope uh, those of you that are listening will get is kind of this result and to see if, um, if there are ways to use it maybe in your own research and uh, you know, I hope maybe even industry will, will pick it up. So here, here is this experiment. It's an experiment in which we have the same amount of stress and recovery. So it's, it's kind of a half-half, but it's different um, times. So we have anything from one hour to one hour, two hours, two hours, four hours, four hours, and six hours, six hours. So the, if you think in terms of the utility, you know, the amount of time that the circuit is used is the, really the same amount. So if you are, let's say, uh, doing this for 12 hours, you are going to have six hours in which the circuit is active and six hours in which it is inactive, uh, except that it's, you know, with different schedules. So with the first schedule is, you know, one hour, one hour, you know, 12 times. Second one is, you know, two hours, two hours, six times, and, you know, so on and so forth. But what's interesting in terms of the um, uh, result uh, of the degradation, it's actually quite different. Uh, although you are, the overall amount of stress and recovery is the same, because it is scheduled in a different way, uh, the, uh, the, the overall degradation is very different. So you can see uh, on the right the uh, the kind of the blue um, and and the colors are not really matching. I apologize about that. So the colors the the legend for the colors on the right do not match with the one on the on the left. So the blue is really the six hours six hours on the right. Uh, you see that that one gets the most stress and the amount of both the uh, the reversible stress but also the irreversible stress is um, the highest uh, and then the lowest is for the one hour one hour so that's kind of the quantitative aspect but the qualitative aspect is even more interesting because if you look at the one hour one hour there is really no uh, irreversible uh, degradation all the degradation that you see is this of this reversible uh, type. And basically what that means is that uh, in a long run, the, um, um, you know, the, the, the penalty for, uh, for uh, this uh, stress and recovery is, uh, you know, quite uh, reasonable and it will not lead to uh, this type of, uh, you know, catastrophic event or uh, hard uh, fault. Uh, 
So again, the really surprising result of this is that you can, and I'm saying almost because, you know, <laughs> it, this is, uh, you know, we're not doing it for an infinite time, but at least for, you know, the kind of the, the normal times that we looked at, there is almost no irreversible stress when you apply active um, accelerated recovery with a specific schedule. So again, the, and the idea, intuitive idea is to apply this stress only until the, uh, you can think about the slow traps would start to get filled. So basically do not let the device stress to the point where uh, the, the, the wear out is not uh, reversible anymore. Uh, so there is a very good biological analogy. So I like analogies. I already gave you the mechanical analogy with the, the pile of rocks. There is a biological analogy with, with us, you know, with humans or, you know, any, any other living thing. Uh, in many ways, the fast reversible stress is what happens daily with us, right? We wake up in the morning, we do, we go to work. But then what do we do at night? Well, we try to sleep. Uh, and um, the, uh, this nightly sleep leads to a reversible recovery. You know, we don't feel necessary. We, we do get older every day, <laughs> um, you know, but the amount that we get older every day is really uh, not, uh, you know, detectable at the, at the level of a day. So... Uh, and, you know, you can look at the um, reverse question. So what would happen if we didn't go to sleep every night? That would be terrible, right? I mean, we would literally die. And um, based on these experiments, uh, I think what we are say, seeing is that this same thing is true for electronics. Uh, that these, you know, the, electro the integrated circuits, they need... Uh, this kind of sleep, and here by sleep I mean, you know, recovery from stress, um, and that means not just, you know, uh, turning off the, 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 you know, the power, uh, turning them off, but, you know, because when we sleep, we don't just turn off, there are some active uh, phenomena in our bodies that, um, uh, you know, actually do uh, uh, lead to, to recovery. Uh, so we are uh, we are kind of seeing the need to have these active sleep day night uh, rhythms, which we you know they are called circadian rhythms for biological systems, um, and you know have this kind of proactive recovery. Uh, so I'm I'm going to move a little bit uh, faster from now on. So this was NBTI. Similar arguments uh, you can make for uh, electromigration. Uh, so again, electromigration is very different from MBTI. You have current instead of voltage. But other than that, you know, many similarities. Temperature accelerates the process. Uh, you have, you know, a mechanical move. This is actually maybe much closer to the mechanical analogy with the pile of rocks. Uh, and you have... Um, you know, you have passive recovery, just stopping the stress, but you also have active recovery. And active recovery means to pass a current in the opposite direction. You know, for MBTI, it was applying a negative uh, voltage. Here we apply a negative current. Uh, and doing it at high temperature would accelerate that. And uh, here are some uh, experiments. So we did measurements and, you know, we found... Uh, very similar uh, results qualitatively from uh... so so this was kind of about the theory uh, now we are circuits people so you know the the kind of the question is how do you really do this on a on a circuit so we looked at you know many different things and here, again, I hope that those of you that are listening will come with your own creative ways of uh, um, um, 
you know, taking advantage of uh, this idea. Uh, so there are, you know, there are several things that you need. You need a negative voltage. Again, people know how to generate negative voltages on chips. So, you know, we used uh, one of those methods. Uh, and then, you know, uh, you need to be able to apply negative voltages in different uh, ways. Again, this, um, you, you can come with your own uh, way of doing it. We, we have this kind of uh, power gating uh, scheme uh, of doing that. Uh, and then uh, the other question is if you want to accelerate, Again, there are many ideas you can, I mean, many, most of the time uh, temperature is something that you want to avoid. So you can take advantage, for example, if you have a multi-core uh, system, you know, some of the idle cores can go into active recovery and take advantage of the heat temperature generated by the other cores. Uh, but you can also have an on-chip, uh, you know, uh, heat generator to to give you the uh, temperature um, for uh, electro migration similarly you can think of ways of uh, switching the direction of the current with uh, you know transistors arranged in uh, uh, in different configurations um, so this was work that we did uh, with a uh, former PhD student, Shin Fei, a few years back. More recently, we started to look, and again, because of this uh, generic and general view of looking at uh, stress and recovery, uh, you know, we started to look at non-volatile memory. And uh, again, the same kind of arguments uh, that you can make uh, that we made for BTI and electromigration, you can also make for um, uh, non-volatile memory. And one reason why we are specifically interested also in memory uh, is because uh, we are part of a center that's uh, focused on um, uh, processing in mem memory and intelligence storage. And when you are doing processing in memory, an unintended consequence uh, is the increase actually in the uh, activity uh, on the on the memory? Um, you know, because the memory, because you are doing processing in memory or closer to memory, you are actually act you know actively using that memory um, um, at a higher rate, which means that you are stressing that memory at a higher rate. So some solution for that problem uh, becomes even more important. Uh, so here is a list. I'm not going to, to kind of spend time here, but the issue here is this endurance row, the second row, uh, that is a problem for uh, uh, you know, most of the non-volatile memories that, that we are interested in. So, um, you know, two kind of flavors of non-volatile memories that we, we looked at our uh, RAM uh, or Memristor. And uh, here we have some samples from um, um, a collaborator, uh, Dima Strukov at UCSB. Um, so we did some work with this, but uh, more, uh, more thoroughly, we actually looked at uh, Flash NAT. Uh, and again, in the interest of time, I'm going to move a little bit uh, faster. Um, the, um, um, you know, the stress and recovery here are in many ways uh, similar to the BTI because, you know, they still have to do with trapping and detrapping of charge uh, in the oxide. And um, um, again, in the same way that for BTI and electromigration, uh, um, you know, you have uh, passive recovery. Um, we actually looked at that. We looked at that quite some time ago before uh, the current interest. At the time, we did not really understand this active recovery, accelerated recovery. Uh, but even, even, you know, even at the time, 12 years ago, we still kind of got a lot of traction from uh, the notion that... Uh, 
you you can benefit in the way you use a flash device by explicitly taking uh, recovery into account. So uh, not considering recovery explicitly is uh, actually a, a weakness uh, because you are missing on good opportunities. So now in terms of accelerated recovery, it, it's actually harder to do things at the at the device level with flash because you don't really have access so here I, i'm showing uh, some results uh, from from the literature uh, but other people have also looked uh, so this is basically accelerated recovery so just using temperature um, you know um, what they call baking um, to uh, to recover uh, the um, uh, the device uh, for flash and you know it's it's quite uh, valid uh, there has been some reporting of uh, active recovery uh, for flash also in the literature uh, they, no one calls this active recovery i should say but you know it's it's really uh, um, uh, basically this is an experiment in which um, uh, they increase the number of erase cycles. Uh, and you see that by increasing, so, you know, in, in, in this particular experiment, an erase cycle is like active recovery because, you know, it's kind of the opposite of a program. Uh, you do the opposite. Uh, and, you know, the more erase cycles you do, uh, the more you reduce the erase error rate. Uh, so... Um, again, when you deal with processing in memory and intelligent storage, uh, you really need, uh, um, you know, this active accelerated recovery. So let's see how that goes. So again, this is a setup. Um, uh, and, and I should also mention that uh, in this kind of, war, uh, you know, uh, field, um, there are no good models. It's very hard to do any kind of research based on simulation and models. And, you know, because even the physics is still not well understood. So no matter what you do, eventually you need to have measured data because otherwise no one would believe you. So, um, you know, we, we did start at the beginning to try to do some modeling and things like that, but eventually, you know, you. You, you really need to, to go uh, down in the trenches and, uh, uh, you know, get some experimental data. So um, the, um, um, again, the experimental setup uh, uses some SLC NAND flash, uh, you know, with some, um, um, you know, setup for uh, program erase. But the, uh, the key here is that we have tried to apply this concept of a circadian rhythm. In other words, to have different schedules for stress and recovery and see if we get similar results um, like for, um, but like we get for um, uh, the uh, BTI and um, uh, electromigration. And yeah, so I, I'm going to go a little bit uh, faster here to get to the actual results because, you know, I, I, I do want to give some time for a Q&A. So here are the experimental results. Uh, and um, uh, there are, you know, uh, a set of different uh, schedules, you know, with different amounts uh, of uh, pro program erase cycles and uh, recovery times. Uh, and they are all kind of at uh, high temperature. So the accelerated part is there. And uh, what you see, so on the x-axis here, you have the uh, program erase cycle count. And on the y-axis, you have the byte error rate for the different cases. And again, like in the case for BTI, what you can see is some schedules, like the yellow one, uh, leads to much more uh, degradation than some other uh, schedules, like the brown one on the bottom. Uh, and 
you know, this is incredibly promising in terms of both kind of validating um, our, you know, this general idea that we have that, you know, uh, with the same amount of stress, you can get quite different degradation levels if you schedule your stress in different ways. So in other words, you can get, you know, um, the same amount of work out of a device without degrading it uh, as much if you schedule it in, a, in the right way. And again, here I'm putting uh, next to each other the flash on the left and the BTI on the right to kind of make the case that in the same way, like for BTI, we had one schedule that led to, you know, a flat kind of, uh, um, you know, curve uh, to the brown one on the left, which is almost uh, flat. You know, it's, it's a little bit... Uh, for flash, it's much harder to get these nice, uh, clean uh, graphs because, um, again, there's much more going on. But fundamentally, I think we 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 can show we, or we showed already that uh, you can get um, uh, you know very similar results for flash. So um, again, now um, here here are kind of the um, um, you know, the, the big picture things. So, you know, there is the uh, um, heating, you know, the temporal part, um, uh, you know, how do you do it? Fine grain, uh, coarse grain, you know, with this circadian rhythm, maybe daily. Um, you can do the accelerated recovery uh, proactive, and this is really, uh, you know, this is what I would call as soon as possible. Uh, or you can do it in an, as late as possible. But again, to get back to the biological analogy, as soon as possible, you know, or proactive would be, okay, you go to sleep every night, even if you are not so tired. As late as possible would be you only go to sleep when you are really tired. And, you know, uh, we kind of know that that's not a good... Um, uh, thing to do. Now, all these things are going to, to be very different depending on uh, what kind of device you are talking about. Again, if it's an iPhone or a smartphone, you know, an Android phone, uh, it's a very different scenario. You can always recover at night versus if it's an institutional or cloud device where again you may have to have some duplication um, so again that's that's uh, kind of future research uh, in terms of doing uh, heating um, on the dye for flash there are already uh, publications about how to do that there is a company that's trying to actually market some of that uh, something that we looked at and with this i'm i'm almost done um, is if you have a, an intelligent storage device like an SSD where you want to do some computation but you also need to have some actual storage, then you really need to think about a situation where you have two types of storage. You have a hot storage part, uh, which is the part you know where you have fast stress fast recovery and you try to take advantage of the things that you know we i've been talking about uh, today but then you need another part which is you know kind of the cold storage where you know if you really just need to store uh, you know um, um, data for a long time then you know you you don't want to deal with uh, anything that i talked about today and what's interesting is that the industry already has these concepts uh kind of at the system level in you know the, the big companies uh, google you know microsoft uh, facebook they 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 already have something like this so now you know we are just making it a little bit more explicit and more um, targeted uh, and again, the nice thing is that we are trying to do this. There are some platforms where you can, commercial platforms now, where you can try this. On the right, it's something called an open SSD, 
On the left is a product that Samsung announced with the Xilinx FPGA. So, so I'm done. Uh, to summarize, uh, I hope I gave you a general framework for understanding wear out and recovery. Uh, I did try to emphasize, probably overemphasize. I hope I didn't bore anyone to death. This concept of active and, uh, recovery. Uh, I kind of gave examples: BTI, electro migration, flash, some some processing in memory, intelligent storage. Uh, the proactive recovery, the circadian rhythms, and you know, just uh, an interesting thing when I was searching some you know papers. I, I you know, so on the left is one of our papers uh, that you know where we are making this case. On the right is an act actual biological you know uh, an athlete but if you look at the titles they are almost identical so it's kind of very interesting um, to see this analogy so i need to acknowledge uh, funding um, you know we get funding from many sources uh, grc jump uh, nsf i have to acknowledge Xin Fei, who's now a, a proud assistant professor and che lan he's still a um, uh, PhD student. I also want to plug uh, the a book that Shin Fei and I wrote. So if you want to hear more, uh, list, read more about this, uh, you know, get the book. And I'm going to end with uh, another nice uh, view of the UVA rotonda. So with this, I'm done and I'm open for questions. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Merci, for, for this very nice and interesting talk. So it's open for questions. So please do your questions as soon as possible using the chat, ten, chat channel in the YouTube. So, but waiting, I have one question. So um, you talk also about reliability, but um, the solution, uh, can you comment about the reliability considering radiation effects? As you, yeah. as you told that you are reducing the design margin, no? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So reliability, as you <laughs> uh, rightly allude to, uh, has many, many uh, aspects. Um, and the uh, radiation effect, so, and again, by radiation, I, I assume you mean, uh, you know, uh, alpha particles and soft errors in memories and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so... Because, you know, there is also the, the radiation, um, I, I guess, you know, the, the actual radiation that leads to uh, physical degradation of, um, you know, of um, a part. But, yeah, for the soft errors, this is orthogonal to that. I, I, I don't think we degrade... Um, uh, I, I don't think we, we degrade uh, the soft error rate uh, you are right that uh, we are saying that you don't need as high margins. Um, but I, yeah, uh, it, it's different kinds of margins. The margins that you need for, um, um, you know, for soft errors uh, are mostly about, um, you know, SRAM, DRAM, uh, latches, um and the margins that we are talking about are more the timing margins that have to do with clocking uh, because that's really uh, what, uh, you know, what you lose by, by not explicitly targeting this wear out. You need to margin for them. And the margin really comes in the timing aspect, not, not as much. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's it's. I I don't think I have a good answer. Let, let's put it this way, uh, but it's in many ways it's orthogonal because this deals with what eventually uh, become uh, hard errors, not soft errors. Because you know, once once you violate a margin, uh, you know, and that's true for flash, for BTI, for electro migration. Basically, you know, that device really stops working, as opposed to soft errors where, in principle, you know, you recover from them. Okay, I'm seeing no questions yet in the chat channel, please. We are waiting for your questions. But um, so another point is, um, Hayus, what is your perspective in uh, 
adopting some of your uh, proposals in the industry no? yeah um, I, I mean I think there are really good opportunities and uh, to be honest you know uh, if no one does it maybe I'll start a company to, to do it because there are some really really good opportunities to to bring this either to uh, like I said you know to, to kind of smartphones and things like that um, because there you really have the opportunity of do, doing this, you know, during um, down times, you know, at night. I mean, and probably that's true for laptops and, you know, any, any kind of personal device where, you know, when the owner <laughs> sleeps, you know, you can, you can actually do these processes with no penalty uh, as far as performance. Uh, in the, you know, in the cloud and in the, it's a little bit trickier because they're, you know, obviously they don't want to take the system down to, to get recovery. So you need to be more creative there. Um, um, and yeah, so it, it's not, it's not as obvious the, the best way of doing it. I think for, for portable devices, it's pretty obvious uh, that, you know, you can do it. Um, and again, you can even imagine some kind of a, again, if you need higher temperature, you know, you can imagine some kind of a box where you put this in and, you know, it gets heated up. Um, so yeah, there are, there are many ways. Um, I, I, I mean, you know, that's why I'm giving a talk like this with the hope that maybe, uh, someone will see it and adopt it. Um, that's, that's all I can say right now. Yeah, about the cloud, uh, so uh, in most cases, they have redundancy you now in the system. So maybe they can do recover in the backup when the, and so on, and then switch to do the recovery in the other one. And... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, so our audience uh, is not... Uh, it's silent. It's okay. ...providing questions today. <laughs> Okay. So, um, as I have no more questions, so thank you very much. Sure, thank you.